Welcome back to Human Humane Architecture here on ThinkTech Hawaii. We're broadcasting live from our cosmopolitan capital city of Honolulu, Hawaii. And uh, whereas until now we have always brought in and casted uh, people who have a most constructively critical, most critically constructive approach, uh, who are from or on our islands, um, ever since we got contacted here, however, a lot of things have come to us that we were, um, uh, you know, had second thoughts about, but it also uh, provides the excellent opportunity to uh, bring in the best stuff, the good stuff from, from somewhere else. So this is a premiere today and the debut of uh, broadcasting from um, beyond our front yard, or I should say our 360 degree front pond. And we start off with one of our immediate neighbors um, across uh, the Pacific Ocean. And uh, I could not think of anyone better to start this new uh, phase in the show uh, as to bring someone in as a guest without whom I wouldn't sit here today. Uh, we've known each other for more than a decade and I consider him to be my coach. So let's welcome Professor Chris Ford to the show. Hi, Chris. Hello, Martin. Uh, thank you for the invitation and always great to reconnect with you. Please tell us where exactly you are right now and where you come from. Oh yeah, sure. So, so my background is as an architect and I've uh, had good fortune to work in some distinguished design practices of others. Uh, I was able to work in the New York office of Richard Meyer and Partners for four years in New York. Uh, and then Tucson, Arizona, was there for about three years working for uh, a couple of different guys. Uh, and it was during that time that I actually started teaching in the evenings. Um, and so that two years of being an adjunct lecturer at the University of Arizona, it reinforced a, a kind of long-term uh, desire to, to become an architectural educator. Uh, and so it was at that point that um, that I applied to, interviewed with, and, and became your colleague at the University of Nebraska. Um, and so uh, there was something interesting that happened to me when I turned 40 years old, and that was that I decided to have a, a pretty productive midlife crisis. And that was that even though my background was from architectural practice, I was curious what my path would have looked like had I gotten a PhD. Uh, and so uh, to the more direct answer to your question, Martin, is that uh, I'm in Palo Alto, California, uh, which is in Silicon Valley. Uh, and so uh, I have a slide here, the, the first one that's up, that I just want to share with you the types of companies that have um, some either headquarters or, or have offices here in this region. Uh, and it's because of Silicon Valley that either our software or hardware or even combinations of software and hardware are, are coming from, at least those, those elements that we use. Uh, and, and with that, Martin, I can just tell you that I'm learning about design from the angle of approach from engineering, and it's absolutely invigorating. So you're currently more specifically at what prestigious institution you're talking <laughs> from? Well, I, I am a PhD candidate at Stanford University, uh, and, and Stanford is, is one of the three engines that, that has historically really driven Silicon Valley. Um, and so in slide two here, I can share with you that um, the reason why I was attracted to engineering at Stanford uh, is that it, it looks and feels differently from engineering practice at, at most other universities. And one reason for that is because this is ground zero for design thinking. Um, design thinking is, is uh, there's a lot of different versions of it depending upon where you go. And, and what I would share with you, Martin, is that there are two key characteristics of it as, as practiced here. Uh, first is that it's user-centered, um, and, and that's quite refreshing from the, the kind of pedigree that you and I come from in, in the value system. The second thing, uh, as this picture suggests, is that there's a very high emphasis on physical prototyping and also testing uh, as a pathway towards um, uh, innovation. Um, so more specifically, I'm with a group called the Stanford Center for Design Research. Uh, I find myself right now as, as really the, the only one with an explicit interest in the built environment. That's okay. Uh, I've been working on building a, a platform, if you will, uh, and it's starting to attract uh, some other colleagues, uh, not necessarily in architecture, uh, but, but in other allied fields. Mm -hmm. And we're both, many things we share, but one, one is that we're both urbanites. You talked about you went through many cities and uh, 
on both uh, coasts, on both ends, so to speak, and uh, we're reporting, broadcasting from a city here. You want to talk about the next slide, number uh, four? Yeah, sure. So, so slide four, uh, I can confirm that I have a general interest in the built environment, uh, but I have a specific interest in global urbanization. Um, and, and then particularly the special needs, I'll say, of, of urban dwellers. Um, this, this slide is a graphic from the Rockefeller Foundation, and uh, I'd like to call attention to the middle image, if you will. It was about 2012 or 2013 that we crossed an important threshold, uh, and that is that for the first time in human history, now more than 50% of our world's population now lives in cities. And interestingly enough, cities only occupy about 3% of the Earth's land mass. Um, looking forward uh, to 2050, our urban populations are expected to grow exponentially um, due to migration, but then also for increased birth rates. And, uh, and Martin, I have to share with you, I'm nervous actually about our respective universities, Stanford and the University of Hawaii included, um, that our universities and institutions might not be able to keep up with this uh, proportional amount of research required mm -hmm. uh, to, to not only keep up with this growth, but also to get far enough ahead to provide leadership uh, during this future uh, trajectory of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but you're, you're definitely on the right track, my friend, uh, with regards to your human or humane architecture series, because ultimately I think that we share an emphasis on, on prioritizing end users in these urban settings. Thanks for uh, caring for us. This is mutual. We're nervous and worried about ourselves. And when I'm saying here we're in a uh, cosmopolitan uh, capital city, I'm bragging a little bit because compared to other cities, which the next slide, uh, number five, will show, uh -huh. we, uh, we, it's a wishful thinking. We would like to be more of a city. Sure. Well, it's a quote Peter Williams here at Stanford Civil Engineering. Cities present concentrated risk, but they also present concentrated opportunity. And so what this slide is pointing out, several things actually, but what I would call your attention to is that on the far right with the, with the blue cities, here in the United States, we only have nine cities with populations that exceed 5 million people. And we could probably name those pretty quickly. New York City, Chicago, Los Angeles, uh, Houston, Phoenix, Dallas, and, and then a couple of others as well. Uh, sorry, I can't recall those. But by proportion in China, they have 80 cities currently that have populations of 5 million or more. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting to me how through the combination of, of both their, their federal government type, but then also their funding mechanism, that they actually do have a proportionate amount of, of funding to their, re, their um, sorry, their universities and institutions uh, to provide research leadership on this front. Mm -hmm. And there is a specific uh, part of the city that is of particular interest for you, and this is why the audience has a little glimpse because they saw the, the show's name, which is called The Infrastructural Problem and the Architect. Right. So if we can get the next slide and you talk a bit about uh, yeah. infrastructural and, and especially conditions, right? Yeah, sure. So uh, slide six, right? I, I think that out of everything about cities, I'm particularly interested in infrastructure. Uh, and I think that this is because we have an enormous opportunity as architects uh, to engage infrastructural design problems. Uh, and so Martin, if you allow me to, to simplify, if, if architecture is the appropriation of material to create habitable space, whether that be my office or, or your studio, then what I find in infrastructure is that it is also the appropriation of material, but it's towards the end of, of transferring uh, important resource units for consumption, for human consumption, whether that be in a city environment or suburban environment or even a rural environment. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing that's interesting to me though is that for urban dwellers, they're absolutely dependent upon the persistent performance of these resource systems uh, for, for resources um, that, that's critical for uh, not just um, urban lifestyles, but, but actually life itself. Mm -hmm. and, and your next uh, slide is illustrating that very well in analyzing four primary problematic conditions you see, right? Right. I, I'm, I'm still admittedly in earnest on the, the first half of my PhD research, and I've canvassed about 30 different failure events. And what I'm finding is that there are four categories of failure modes that are emerging. 
Uh, the first type are natural catastrophes. So in the top left corner, this is a, a photograph of 1906 in, in San Francisco. There was an earthquake, but then that triggered a fire that raged for about three days. Uh, what's interesting to me is that inside of the first seven days, two thirds of the population was evacuated off the peninsula. Uh, in the top right, we have another category, uh, and that is mechanical faults. Um, and this in particular is in two th from 2007, the, the I-35 bridge collapse outside of Minneapolis, Minnesota. The bottom left, uh, this is uh, typical of, of what I'm calling animal and human intervention. Um, in particular here, this is actually a, a high-powered uh, sniper rifle attack that was for an electrical substation immediately south of San Jose. This occurred in 2013. And then in the bottom right, Martin, this is actually the scariest of the four. Uh, and, and by that, I, what I mean is that it's resource unit depletion. The infrastructure system itself could perform exactly as designed and as specified, but if there's not enough stock in the system for transmission and distribution, then the system fails. Mm -hmm. um, and, and all of these types of failures definitely um, create inconveniences, and, and again, they, they could in fact cause loss of human life. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can confirm that uh, this is a very uh, rewarding research topic mm -hmm. because it directly serves the public welfare. Mm -hmm. Before we go into our little uh, promotional break, let's jump over the next two very uh, doomy, dark, uh, black pictures, which problematize even more, right? The subject matter of infrastructural problems. Yeah, sure. So um, let me, let's see. Let's, let's go to slide number eight, please. Uh, yeah, what is the infrastructural problem? Well, Martin, I, what I find is that it's actually a compelling design problem. Uh, in, in the context of the, the, this design problem is informed by, by four quick things. Uh, first is that it, it is dealing with increased internal loads due to this um, uh, increasing urban population. But it's also dealing with increased external loads uh, due to uh, the threats uh, that are of increasing strength and frequency. Um, in the U.S., we're actually finding our end of useful mechanical life of our first generation of infrastructure. And finally, the second generation system that is to come online, it will likely require incredibly long gestation periods for development. And in particular, uh, the San Francisco Bay Eastern span of, of the new bridge from idea to uh, open for use actually required 24 years. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a very critical devil's advocacy question, which is slot number 10. Everything you talk about, isn't that traditionally something for civil engineers more than architects? It is, and interestingly, civil engineers, um, despite their decades, if not centuries, of, of leadership and engagement with these types of problems, um, they themselves are, are retooling. Uh, and so they have um, historically put a strong emphasis on robustness, and that is making sure that the capacity of their forthcoming solution would exceed any type of, of static or dynamic future load. And what we're finding is that they're retooling themselves to become more familiar to uh, resilience, designing for resilience, which to some degree admits failure. Uh, and, and in that case, loads will exceed capacity, but there will be embedded qualities within that design solution uh, so that it has a quicker reboot time, if you will, to, from say computer hardware, uh, but then also recovery to ultimately advantage uh, the populations that they serve. Fabulous. That, that's a good point to take a little promotional break uh, to after the break return and introduce Chris, the infrastructural architect, more. See you soon. Sure. You're watching ThinkTech Hawaii, meeting people we may have not otherwise met, helping us understand and appreciate the good things about Hawaii. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel, host of Life After Statehood, and I do this with uh, our regular contributor, Ray Tsuchiyama, uh, and we try to make sense of all that has happened in Hawaii, all that is happening, and all that should happen. <laughs> Ray, what do you think of that show? I feel delighted to be part of Life After Statehood, since after 59, so many things happened to the state of Hawaii, yet things could have gone in other directions. And that's what I'm fascinated about, that Hawaii has had a great history, but could have an even greater future. There you go. I believe that. I'm with you all the way. Ray Tsuchiyama and me, Jay Fidel, we do it as much as we can on Life After Statehood. Come around and see what we have to say. Thanks. Welcome back to today's show and our infrastructural architect, uh, Chris Ford. 
If we can get the next uh, picture, number 11, that's one that pleases me because we see Dieter Rahms here, a fellow German. So what does he have to do with all that? Yeah, sure, absolutely, Martin. First, for architects to properly engage in infrastructural design problems, we need to first alter our value set. Uh, and so I want to go through three slides that, that start to help us uh, with, with tools to do that. And, and I appreciate this, uh, this capture from the 2009 film Objectified of Dieter Rams. He's got it absolutely correct. Uh, and that is that, that we as architects, we're designers and, and we're not the fine artists that we're often confused with. Um, this, is, this is important, uh, an important distinction to make moving forward because designers engage problems that are outside of themselves whereas artists engage problems of their own making. That's one important difference. The other difference is that all design solutions, and this includes all design disciplines and the work that they produce, uh, that there's a certain obligation to usability. So you're saying, and that's next slide, there are adjustments to be made and maybe in the area of aesthetics, right? That's where you're going? Yeah, yeah, so slide number 12. Uh, I think that another step that we can take towards changing our values is that we can clarify what is the contest that we want our design solutions to enter. Uh, by that, what I mean is, uh, are, we, are, are we mindful of or, or perhaps even distracted by the photogenic attributes uh, of our solutions so as to win beauty contests? Uh, or are we mindful of the performative qualities that our design solutions have so that instead they could win races? Now, with that, um, I, I just find that there's, there's a, a lot more creative territory that lies ahead of us uh, if we were to explore for ourselves this issue of performance. And, and I use performance there as a, as a measure of a function. Uh, but fortunately, Martin, we actually don't have to choose between the two. Um, and that's because Vitruvius has uh, laid out some principles for us about 2,000 years ago uh, in which we can actually have both. And to that extent, let's bring the next picture, which also brings someone back who we have been talking about a couple of shows ago. Yeah, so uh, I, I think I'm using a, an image here of Buckminster Fuller. And Martin, it's my understanding a couple of weeks ago, you had a guest, uh, DeSoto Brown, yes. who, who walked through uh, perhaps the portfolio of Buckminster Fuller, but particularly the work that, that is uh, on, on your set of islands. Mm -hmm. um, I'm appreciating this quote because what it does is that it prompts us as architects to rethink the organizational uh, relationships between the Vitruvian principles. Uh, for those in, in your audience that might not be familiar with Vitruvius, uh, let me share with you that he was a Roman. Uh, he was also a master builder. Uh, he was an architect, an engineer, a planner, a strategist, a problem solver, and also an author. He actually authored uh, De Architer <laughs> Architectura, mm -hmm. uh, which also translates and is known by the 10 books on architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the oldest surviving architectural text that we have today. And, and again, it's about 2,000 years old. And a translation of those principles uh, comes into three words, firmness, commodity, and delight. And Martin, I, I think that uh, historically in schools of architecture, we think about the relationship between these three Vitruvian principles as being some type of Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. And the shared overlap of the three is where compelling work emerges. Mm -hmm. And instead, I, I'm curious about um, a new hierarchy of actually thinking about it as a stacked pyramid with firmness being the base, with commodity being the middle section, uh, and with delight being the pinnacle. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think Buckminster Fuller would actually agree. Mm -hmm. And you now in your PhD investigations, at the beginning you said something rather intriguing to me I want to return to. That's what you call the user-centric process, right? And you have a couple of very compelling yes. images that illustrate that. Could we have the next one? Yeah. Sure, sure. So. Um, what does it mean to actually design from a user-centered uh, perspective? Uh, what it means uh, for me, in, in my particular interest, is that to design infrastructure for the city of San Francisco, then I'm not starting with a satellite photograph, and I'm not starting with a measured site drawing. Uh, instead, I'm, I'm converging to the one variable in, in this problem that I want to put the highest importance on. And then from there, I want to work outwards. And so in this case, uh, slide number 14 is, is showing the urban dwellers of San Francisco. 
Um, the next slide, slide 15, uh, actually takes um, a, a snapshot of, of some of the numbers that come out of San Francisco. Uh, relative to other cities in terms of its population, it's actually low in overall number. Uh, in terms of land area, it's also quite small. Uh, as a peninsula, it's landlocked. But it actually has the highest, sorry, the second highest population density of cities in the United States. It's second only to New York City, uh, with Boston being number three. Uh, slide 16. I actually want to take a, a little bit of a pause, so I don't know, maybe 30 seconds or so, uh, and, and ask your audience to actually brainstorm on what are the resource units uh, that we consume, but we are dependent upon centralized systems to provide us and to deliver us. Mm -hmm. But you help uh, us out a little bit with the next slide with some suggestions, Brian. I do, I do. If, if we had Jeopardy theme music, now would be a great time for that, mm -hmm. but I don't think we have it. Don't make me uh, think. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so slide 17, please. Uh, I imagine that if we had more time, I, I bet that uh, a lot of these would be similar. Uh, so starting in the top left, uh, megahertz is a, a way of, of indicating that we need access to communication systems. Um, top right, uh, uh, megawatt hours, we need access to electricity. Uh, we also need access to food, and, and the unit that we can measure that would be kilocalories. Uh, at the very bottom, uh, we, we generate waste. Not that we consume waste, but we certainly generate it, and we, we need to manage that, and that can be measured in tons. And then perhaps of these five, the most important is, is water, mm -hmm. uh, which can be measured in gallons, or from industry standards, we can uh, use the unit of million gallon days. Um, and then you tie these all together in the next slide, right? Yeah, so slide 18. Um, working out from the urban dwellers to the types of, of resource units that they require, um, then we can be mindful of the directionality of flows. Um, and uh, this, this is important because it starts to suggest and, and provide insight into how resource systems were generated to actually transmit and distribute these important resource units. And so my uh, PhD investigation is ultimately looking at the effectiveness of a next generation infrastructure type that would be hybridizing uh, the delivery of these various units for urban dwellers in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. uh, and th let's get back to that uh, nervousness that we share and bring up the next slide, Ryan. You have a little bit of a more recent timeline here, and 2008 is the first, you know, snapshot yeah. of time. You have something yeah, to so share. Yeah, so slide right? 19. Uh, for t Martin, for the remaining time that you and I have together here, the next five minutes or so, um, I'm inviting us to consider a, a convergence to just the energy sector. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're absolutely right. This slide, number 19, um, was essentially a, a snapshot in 2008. And that was, I can share with you that electric utilities at that point were actually quite nervous. And that was because we were becoming an increasingly plug-in society, mm -hmm. uh, each of us having more than one uh, computer or computational device that required an electric charge. But also there was concern over the paradigm shift of moving away from petroleum to fuel our own automobiles, but actually the, um, the, the electricity as being a fuel type for our own transportation. Mm -hmm. um, with that, uh, slide 20. Um, I was gonna say, this, this might be still be like people would say, you know, this is for automotive engineers and managers. And at that point, I say hi to my son, Joey, who is in a master's in that field. Hi, Joey, still hang in there. But this one here is a year later where you actually get some very interesting uh, research funding and transi transition that, um, that your, your investigations, your research into an architectural proposal, which we see now. Explain a little bit more what's behind that. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so in 2009, uh, when Martin and I were both faculty at uh, the College of Architecture at the University of Nebraska, uh, I was fortunate to, to have a research grant that looked at um, a feasibility study, if you will, uh, for a microgrid. Uh, and so these are a couple of renderings that came out of that investigation of a, a not so micro microgrid. Um, and uh, what some of the uh, design requirements for it were to intentionally position it within the urban fabric of downtown Lincoln, 
uh, so that it could generate megawatt hours of electricity uh, in the same environment where they would actually be consumed. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was believed that there would be uh, some, some savings, some performance uh, efficiencies that would be found as opposed to the transference of uh, a kilowatt hour of electricity over 100 miles. Mm -hmm. and, um, and let's just, mm -hmm. because we're running out of time, Lincoln, Nebraska, sure. we talk about in the middle of everywhere as far as land mass. We're in the, in the middle of everywhere as far as water. So next slide is an interesting relationship to us here. Yeah, slide 21. Uh, whereas slide 20, I was, I was sharing some, uh, some lab investigations. Um, what is very exciting to me now in 2017 is that we have several companies that are actually producing and implementing microgrids for different populations. So this slide number 21 uh, is, is showing a project from uh, both Tesla and Solar City. They have stood up a microgrid in Tao in American Samoa um, that uh, has about 600 residents on the island. Um, it had 100% of its electrical supply previously generated by, by diesel generators, and there was interruption to their performance because of um, uh, impacts to their supply chain. However, um, for within the past year, this new system has stood up. Uh, it has 1.4 megawatts of, of solar capability. And what's interesting is that you can tell in the, the top right where those uh, white clusters are, those are actually power packs by Tesla, uh, stationary battery storage. And as such, they act as capacitors. Uh, they actually have three days worth of electrical charge for the island's inhabitants. It only takes about seven hours of sunlight to completely recharge them. This is, this is incredibly exciting uh, technology that is being deployed, Martin, for actually shaping uh, our built environment. That and, reminds um, me of one of our islands, Kauai. Yes. So Kauai is, is another site location for the next project out of this partnership between Tesla and Solar City. Uh, Kauai in, in 1992 was hit by Hurricane Aniki. Uh, and what was interesting is that in the aftermath of that storm, there were about 7,000 uh, homeless. Um, and, and, and by that, what I mean is that there was also a proportional amount of infrastructure failure. Mm -hmm. um, they have a, a system that, uh, in working in collaboration with the KIUC, the Kauai Island Utility Cooperative, uh, they have a, a 12 kilowatt um, uh, solar array mm -hmm. and then a 52 megawatt hour uh, supply of power packs. I'm doing something really mean cutting off. I don't have to because you stopped. Chris, we got to bring you back. I have to add, you have visited us some years ago. You will visit us a couple of months ahead. And at this point, I want to thank you for bringing this fresh breeze of innovation, blowing this in our face over from the valley. And thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Martin. Great to see you again, buddy. All right. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.